Take a deep breath, exhale, and join us for this episode of Hope Out of the Darkness. Shel Pavlis is a non-professional learning to navigate the world of suicide prevention. As a volunteer of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention in Orange County, California, she chats with people who, like her, are affected by suicide. Hear the real life stories, learn how they keep living life to the fullest, and find out what can be done to stop suicide. Join the conversation with fellow AFSP volunteers and mental health professionals, all of whom have their own stories about suicide. Let's find hope out of the darkness. Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Shel Pavlis, and I have a really interesting guest for you today. Um, he, we happen to know each other, uh, yet his background is so diverse, it fits right into the conversations that I like to have for this podcast um, so I'm really excited to start the conversation with him. I, I just want to say a quick hello, and then I'll tell you about his background. So welcome. This is Scott O'Donnell. Hello, welcome Shell. Hi. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. Of course. Of course. So the reason Scott's background is so unique is because he's worked in, in the medical field for a, a long time. He also has a background as a clinical therapist. And then I'm going to peek. I don't want to, I want to get all this right. His bio is so long and so impressive with all his experience. I'm not even going to read it all because it would probably take the whole podcast. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I'll, of course, it'll be in the show notes for all of you to to reference. Um, But let me just touch upon a couple things, which I think will give you peace of mind that Scott's background and his experience really is important as we go into our discussion here. So he's a clinical therapist and workplace safety security expert, and he's been doing that for 25 years. He's developed employee safety, active shooter, workplace violence, security, and conflict resolution programs that create a workplace culture That'll bring out the best in your employees. He's also an expert in emergency management. He's certified by FEMA and Homeland Security in internal and external disasters, specializing in incident command. Um, He holds seminars, workshops, breakouts, coaching sessions um, about all of that and creating a healthy working environment. And I'll, I'll have Scott explain a little more Um, You know, when we're done, of course, specifically what he does, but um, also on his clinical therapist side, he's um, he's worked with people who have challenges because they're bipolar. They have anxiety, depression, PTSD, post-traumatic stress and disorder, sorry, um, addiction, chemical dependency, and um, he specializes in childhood trauma. So. That's a really interesting mix because he's able to use those skills that he has in that area to actually enhance his workplace programs. So, so let's, let's dive right in because, um, we have a lot to talk about. Um, so first of all, just talk about your role, you know, with hospitals and healthcare and what types of systems and protocols are in place when it comes to a patient that comes in who's attempted suicide? Okay. Uh, I will go down the many things that I do, but we'll start it in the ER. When an individual comes in, uh, they have ideation okay. or someone feels that they do. Sometimes when they get there and they, they don't come in as ideation, but as they start talking, the warning signs go off. So if we have someone that comes in ideation, but they might have some other medical uh, problems. They'll come in, they will get screened in the ER. Okay. They have uh, nurses in the ER waiting area that will do the screening and they do the assessment. And then usually in the ER, there's a wait. So, but okay. after the wait, what they'll do, they'll be escorted back into the ER where be brought into a room, the nurse will introduce themselves 
explain the situation, uh, say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have a physician come. It might be 15, 20 minutes as if there's anything that we can get you. And if it's deemed that there is ideation, what happens is the nurse, sometimes assisted by other staff, what they will do is clear the room. Hmm. That means the room, they'll be taking out things that uh, an individual might be able to hurt themselves with and or hurt others with. So they'll clear the room out and they'll do it nonchalantly. They'll be talking to the patient. You know, do you live in the area? Uh, do you have any siblings? It's, it's normally what you want to do is just do the distraction while you're bringing everything out. You know, I'll be right back in. And when you clear the room, uh, what we try and do, the availability is you would have a sitter, a sitter, someone oh. that's clinically trained that would sit outside of the person's room just to observe. And depending on the age of the person or how engaged a person wants to be about conversation and speeding up, then the physician would come in, see the patient, talk with the patient, do a mini assessment. And if they feel it's going down the road of ideation, uh, thoughts of ideation, uh, what they would do then is they would contact, generally most hospitals have a pet team. It's a psychological evaluation team and then that individual will come in, and that's when the screening will start. And there's a couple ways of screening. There's different forms, but some of the standard forms are the ER is the, uh, the CRRSR. And what that is, it's an evaluation on the ideation. And generally, there's six questions. Originally, it's about four pages. So what they've done is condensed it to six yeah. questions just to make it simpler so that it's not confusing the individual, it's not confusing the person that's giving it to you. And generally what happens, they have four and they was like, you answer the first two questions, yes, there's the signs, okay, we need to have a placement for this person. Then there's times they'll say, if they say yes to two, then you have to answer the question six. So there's a format for them, okay. but they use that for the evaluation and there's also another one, it's a PH4-6. And what that does, it's four questions. The first two questions are for anxiety, the rate of anxiety. Uh, I don't have anxiety daily. I have it once a day. I have it half the time. I have it every day. Same thing with uh, questions three and four. They ask different questions for depression. So they rate that on anxiety and depression. Those are the two major ones that they use. And from that screening, if it's determined, yes, there is ideation, yes, there is intent. Uh, sometimes it might explain ways and means. Uh, ways is they have a plan. I know when, I know where Scott O'Donnell lives. He lives at 123 Strawberry Street. I know what time he gets home. I'm going over there tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. That's a plan. Okay. Ways. And then there's means. I have, I own a weapon at home. They describe the weapon and that's what I'm going to use. Generally in ways and means is used. All of us are self-reporters uh, in healthcare, teachers, therapists. Ways and means is used. They can break confidentiality and then they can report it because that's when there's danger. But generally what happens, they ask them all those questions to see what is the scale of ideation that they have. Once they determine that, then what happens, unless they have a medical condition, mm -hmm. they will find placement for that individual. If there's a medical condition, that person can't be released to another setting, an LPS, et cetera, unless they're medically cleared. Okay. So sometimes that might take a day Sometimes, you know, it, a lot of things, heart rate, blood pressure, right. uh, how long they've been in, in restraints. Some places may not take an individual unless they've been out of restraints for over four hours. Some places too, usually the standards four hours uh, okay. before they can and, be placed anywhere. Okay. And the restraints could be, could have been placed on the scene before the patient was even transported or would that be, no. would that be just in, in restraints would be placed on someone that's sometimes they have ideation, uh -huh. but they have dual diagnosis. They might be coming down, uh, from, uh, 
from drugs or alcohol. They're going through withdrawals. Okay. Or they might have been off their meds for usually generally it was around four to six weeks. Let's okay. say someone's bipolar. When they're off their meds for that long, they get manic, but there's not a timetable when. Right. So when you think there's a fear that they're going to hurt themselves or hurt others, because sometimes they come in very aggressive, the restraints are placed. Okay. Now, if it's someone that's very demure, very quiet, it's not showing any signs of that, general restraints aren't put on. But I've okay. just given you the overall effect yeah. of how someone gets cleared if they're in restraints or they don't. Okay, great. Okay, and I just wanted to clarify that a little yes. bit yeah, so, so that everyone would understand. You and I have talked, obviously, a lot, um, and you've mentioned to me in the past about um, if a department is on tilt, can you explain a little bit about that situation? I could probably use another word, but yes, it's when okay. a, patient, a patient comes in and sometimes, like I was saying, it's, they might have been off their meds. And there's not a timetable when someone becomes manic or they snap. Or someone comes in, they have anxiety, depression. They're, they're not used to the setting and they become very upset with the staff. They get aggressive, uh, foul language, uh, physical aggression, jumping out of bed or taking a swing at them. Or just verbally being abusive nonstop to where it wears the caretaker down, it wears the department down. And when they're exhausted, when they've used every avenue that they can, it's not helping. Uh, what I've been asked to do, and I've been doing about 11 years, is I will get a call from the house clinical coordinator. Okay. That's, who, that's the person that oversees the hospital. And or I'll get called from a director, charge nurse manager, saying, we have a situation up here. Would you mind coming up and uh, talking with this individual? Patient? and or visitors, difficult visitors. Hmm. Okay. Oh, that's true, huh? I mean, everyone initially, of course, would think it might be the patient, but of course it could be a, a visitor or an upset family member. Um, there are sometimes a family member does incite the patient. Hmm. The patient was very calm until the visitor came. Oh, and okay. the visitors raised the anxiety of that patient. But generally, when I go into those, when I go into that situation, I take my badge off and I put it in my pocket. And uh, when I enter the room, I just introduce myself as Scott and I just say I'm a hospital representative. And then I start having a conversation with the individual. In those type of situations, and there can be usually in those situations, I will say something to you. It's what I generally say in a speaking engagement, when I look at everyone, I'll say that listening is the most important thing you can do. Mm. It is not. <laughs> it is not. Really? The okay. most important thing that can happen is that that other individual feels that they've been heard. That okay. is the most important thing. There is because a difference. Everyone get that? Who's listening? Listening? <laughs> That is correct. <laughs> yep. And they feel that they've okay. been heard because there's people at home that are never heard. There's people at work that are never heard. But the most important thing is that person feels they've been heard. So when you come across someone that's difficult, ask them what is going on, what's happening in their life. And generally they will say, whatever the situation is, they're very upset. Uh, I don't need these people here. I don't like what's going on here. And I've never been treated like this. What you want to do is continue the conversation. You want to know where they're coming from. So sure. what happens is most people in life don't think that their life is that interesting. And they don't feel that their life experiences are very interesting. You'd be very surprised. So if you could pick up on what that individual is saying, there's something in your life experience somewhere where you can engage with that person and say, I know exactly how you feel. I went through the same thing one time. I've been where you've been. If you continue that conversation, there is now a bond. That individual now feels you know how they feel because you went through it. Yeah. And once that bond happens, that's when the trust comes. Now, after there's trust, two things can happen. One thing is, it's easy to set up boundaries then. 
once you have a trust with that individual, you step out of yourself and go over here and go, but these nurses are doing the best that they can. They really want to help you. But if the foul language, the aggression, yelling and screaming, get out of bed and scaring them continues, these are the situations that are going to happen. And it can even go as far to, I can't have your loved ones in here when you're acting like that. I don't want to do that. I want your loved ones to be here with you. That's most important to me. So please don't put me in that position. That's just one of the scenarios. But when someone feels that they've been heard, it validates their existence, and they feel that they're participating in life. I can give you a quick example of something that just okay. recent, recently happened to me. Okay. There was a department, I get a phone call from the house supervisor, and she said, we have a situation in a certain department. Can you go talk to the staff? They are very fearful. I was already aware of the situation. There was a patient, and the patient wasn't doing very well. And there was a family member that was very, very aggressive, very aggressive, with the staff, with physicians. But it seemed like every time I went down there, uh, he was already gone. But I got his phone. That, I got his phone number, and I'm used to doing that. But at this point, I was asked to go down there because the, st the staff felt fearful. So what I did is I also received something in writing on the computer about this situation, and I read it. And there were certain things what I read what the family member of this individual said. When I went into the department to question the staff, saying, okay, you know, what's going on? I hear that, you know, this family member, they said, well, this family member is asking all this information about us, wants to know what our names are and what's going on. And then he said he's going to come, if anything happens to his father, if we, and he said the words, if he kills his father, I'm coming back for every one of you. And I looked at the whole staff and I said, so that's what he said to you? And they're like, yes. That's okay. terrifying. So what I did then is I had his home phone number and there was also law enforcement. But what occurred to me was everyone said the same thing. And for me, that's, that's not conducive. That's, that's, that's not something that's ordinary for someone to say the exact same things. So what I did then was uh, I called law enforcement in. Law enforcement showed up. I said, we have a situation going on here. I explained the situation. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, were you threatened? And I said, no. He was like, I can't talk to you. I want to talk to us. And I said, well, I'm, let me explain the situation. We'll go talk to him. I brought the sheriffs in. I thought it was worth it. And they interviewed seven nurses and went down what they all said and asked, did he ask your first name? No. Ask your last name? No. Did he ever threaten you? No. Did he ever say he was going to come back and hurt you? No. And halfway through, the sheriffs looked at me and said, uh, why would you call us down? And I said, just stay with me. Hmm. So he went through every single nurse. One nurse said, yes, he did ask me my first name. And I put two and two together, so we leave. And I said, here's an email from an individual that talked to a person on the phone. And that individual was threatening this person on the phone. Hmm. And from that email came the name and last name. What had happened was the staff weren't directly told that. They were indirectly told that. But here's what I want to get back to, the sound of your own voice. And I explained it to the sheriffs. I said, thank you so much. You did awesome. They said, but they didn't say anything. I said, they did. You asked them. Did they ask your name? No. Did you ask your last name? No. Did he ever threaten you? No. Did he ever say he was going to come back and hurt you? No. The sound of their own voice saying that validates that they're not in fear, and they're not going to get hurt. So when they got back into their station, I'm sure their shoulders went down like this, and they thought to themselves, I don't have to be in fear. He doesn't want to hurt me. He never said he was going to hurt me. So I explained to him, I said, it's the sound of their own voice. They just wanted to be heard. I said, you have no idea what you just did for all of them. Wow. So you basically put the whole department at ease yes. through that process. It's very important that that other person feels that they've been heard. Yeah. That is the most important thing you can do for another individual. Yeah, I think that is really wise advice. And it not only is helpful, obviously, for those who are in the medical community, but it kind of carries over into life as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah great. We want to take a quick break and recognize that today's podcast episode may not be appropriate for everyone. If you are in crisis or know someone who is, please call the Suicide Lifeline at 
273-8255 or text the word HELP to 741741. And of course, if you feel you or someone you're with are in danger or experiencing a medical emergency, call 911. So this isn't necessarily related specifically to that, but um, one of the things that we talked about in the past was the behavioral health lockdown. Unit. Yes. How does that unit differ and how is the staff trained differently for that unit or how, or how does that work? Yes. Uh, about three years ago, uh, there were incidences that would be happening and they happen in every lockdown unit. And there was an incident that would happen. When that happens, I will get a phone call and I will view a video. And then generally I will have the managers, HR, somebody that will come in and they'll view it with me. But as I was viewing videos, I would see other things. So what had happened was I started delivering information to many people saying, we have a situation down there. We have situations that need to be corrected. It's to nobody's fault, but that was the only thing that staff knew. So... What had happened was I put together five videos and I set up a meeting with uh, upper level management and I showed the five videos. And after that, I really didn't have to say much. I kind of editorialized a couple of them and I said, so, and they're like, we have a problem. I said, we have a problem. So I put together, they asked me to put together a team, which I did. And it was very intense, intense meaning diving into it. But it was, there's many things that go on that because nothing bad has happened, they continue to do it. So we went through a whole retraining, and it ended up being great. The, uh, the staff injuries went down, the patient injuries went down, and the HCAP scores, which are scores that uh, patients fill out for rating the hospitals, those went up. But in the BHU unit, there's little things like, common knowledge things in our practice, you don't walk in front of somebody, walk by the side. You don't go into a room first and have someone come in with you. Uh, if you see somebody sitting down, sometimes they pull their furniture out, sitting down in the middle of the hallway, instead of just walking by, sit down next to them and just strike up a conversation. Hmm. But with, but with the lockdown units, uh, they can't leave. And so the staff has to be trained when they come in, they have to make sure that door closes. When they leave, they have to make sure that door closes. They have to buddy up and they always have to remember that something can happen at any time. And it's not because there's intent, it's because there's mental illness and people acting out. But there's many things they have to do with when they're checking their clothes when they come in, when and where they can eat. When they have meetings, everything is regimented and documented. Uh, how they sit on their computers, not having their back to the middle of the hallway, they have it against the wall, so there's nobody can come up behind them. Sure. When they do rounding, they make sure they go all the way into the room, not just stick their head in there. And there's right. teams that come in. I'm on one of the teams, environment and care team, and we, and we check for ligature, and that's any device or any area where we think somebody can attach something to it to harm themselves. So, but the, the behavior health units, once they are on a tandem and they're going, it's, they're just regimented to keep doing the same thing and watch for the unknown, but it's different. It's different than a normal setting. Okay. A lot. Yeah. That's, yes. um, that's a good explanation. And a lot of it to me as a lay person seems like common sense, but for all, of, you know, to apply all of it at once, all together, you know, you very definitely have to be trained in the specific procedure. Absolutely. And you have to see the signs that someone's acting out. Yep. And it's, you try not to engage with someone by yourself. If you see something escalating, they have radios, code words, to where they're saying, I need assistance, I'm in this area. And so it's not really setting off the patient. But it's just if you have that little stomach ache or something, so you don't want to be engaged one-on-one, -on -one, so you want to have as many people as you have. Good and they also call code overhead where security will come to okay. assist. Talk about dynamic patients, if you would. Sure. I touched on a little before, and yeah. that's the dynamic patient is the patient that 
is very troublesome for the staff. And the most important thing for staff to do with all patients is engage. When they first come in, you know, obviously they're not doing well. You introduce yourself. It's just the simple things for engaging that sometimes might not happen. Do you live in the area, like I was saying before, just to get to know the individual. But when there is a dynamic patient that's becoming violent, very aggressive, uh, I've gotten the calls where I've gone on my side. I think in 11 years, three, I've probably seen about 1,100. But they also have a dynamic. There's also teams at different hospitals where they have a dynamic team that gets called together. And that's when they have the physician, they have care management, they have what department it's affecting. The manager of the department, the nurse most familiar with the patient, and they huddle and they talk it through. What do we do next? How can we handle this? Do we set up the boundaries? And what are the penalties for the boundaries if they're not followed through with? And okay. so what I team, Oh, sorry. So go just ahead. to clarify, so each team member gives input based on their specific area of expertise towards the next step in the care for the patient. Yes, or what they were experiencing with the patient, yes. Okay, okay thanks. Yes, and then usually two or three people go in and address the situation. Okay. So it's, it's, there's two different ways that it can be approached. Sometimes I've done it by myself, but there are teams throughout many hospitals that gather together just to get more information. Let's go back to, you talked about ways and means, having a plan and then means actually having the specific yes. item or whatever the chosen method is to carry out whatever the plan is, correct? Correct, um, because there is a misnomer about that with healthcare staff. Okay. And I understand their fear. There might be someone that says, I'm going to kill somebody. I'm going to kill Scott. And they call law enforcement and they say, we need this person arrested. They can't arrest somebody for saying they're going to kill somebody. We'd all wish that they could, meaning arrest and then this person get help, but they can't. There has to be a plan and there has to be a device to contact law enforcement to do a house visit to get involved in that. This is something that when you hear this from a child, an adolescent, another adult, that's serious because that's something they've been thinking about a long time and now they have a plan and they have a way they're going to do it. And that's when you need to call law enforcement who could, then will call the local uh, psychological evaluation team from the county or city that you live in, and they will come and do an evaluation. That almost seems like, in a backwards way, a suggestion towards family members who are supporting people who have health challenges, yes. or maybe someone who you know has suicidal ideation, you know, or, and is talking um, about escalating their situation or, you know, obviously causing physical harm to someone else is um, yes. kind of more obvious. But right. uh, so it's the main red flag. It might even be a friend of the friend that approaches you and says, this is what Scott said. He said this, and then he said this. And if you know the signs or you know, okay, that's, I think it's on right now. That's when you can contact authorities or get help. Okay. But so okay. that's not the end all be all because a lot of times it's hard for someone to describe their ideation and describe mm -hmm. their fear. That's why it's very important Good. in a household that there's approachability from all family members, especially parents, that it's a hard thing for a child, adolescent, even a grown up, to admit that they have thoughts of ideation. And if you're not approachable, you'll never know what they're thinking. As I once said, if if you are arguing or fighting in the home, you're arguing and fighting with everyone. You have to be very aware as adults of your surrounding how that other individuals are going to take that. Because sometimes you will not have the approachability and they will not come to you. So That's true. And so yeah, and we talk about that, you know, with as a board member with AFSP. We um it's important to remove the stigma and part of the stigma is perpetuated too, um, un, 
um, not intentionally, but right. sometimes through uh, cultural behavior that's learned, um, you know, that for a lot of reasons. But you're right. If if family members, parents could be approachable and make it more the norm to talk about mental health issues and what you're feeling, then it could go a long way towards helping. Families. We've come a long way. There is an acceptance of talking about it, having mental health issues to where it's, we try, it's, it's normacy. We try and normalize it. So there is approachability. So people right. will reach out, uh, and there are definite signs, you know, within your household if someone's isolated, siloing, or never wants to come out of the room or is never having conversations. If their demeanor changes in a 360 to where they were outgoing, they were always talking with their friends, always on the phone, they're always outside, and all of a sudden that all goes away. You know, those are little warning signs that something is going on. Yep, good ones. Um, yeah, we talk about several of the warning signs in our Talk Saves Lives presentation as well because everyone wants to know what to look for. And it's sometimes not so obvious. Um, it's not. And it, yeah, and especially with teens and adolescents, sometimes it's a little difficult to tell what we call, you know, what's the difference between what we call, I'm, I mean, even the term normal teenage behavior is a little bit of a concern. But... Um, yes. But distinguishing between what an individual's behavior was like and if there's any changes is a huge warning sign. Correct. So, yeah, good. And Thank I know the law at some point says that children have rights. They do when it comes to safety or any type of abuse. Yes, they have rights. Uh, having all the other rights... For me, not so sure that not until they're adult, we should know exactly what they're doing, what they're saying, who they're talking with, what type of conversations that you're having. I understand that there's privacy, but we should be knowing what our children are doing. Absolutely. Yeah, and that all contributes towards the safety of the child as well. Yes. Just generally. Um, yeah, great. So how do you think your training as a therapist altered the way you approach your work and your job? and your job responsibilities on a day-to-day. -day. You, you've touched upon some, you know, some of it. Uh, it was a combination of getting my master's as a clinical therapist and my life experiences. I grew up in a city in the Midwest, big city. Uh, then when I came out to California, I spent a lot of time in uh, South Central and East LA working with families and other factions that I did that for my own personal uh, endeavor education. And from my life experiences, and again, my master's, every day I'm using it at work. There's not one day it doesn't go by where, and a lot of times it's off the record where a manager will say, do you have a couple of minutes? I'll go talk with them, be a director. It could be a nurse. And it's in privacy, just saying, you know, I just, I, I just have this situation. And I do that quite often. And that's all kept hush-hush. I had a situation where, uh, for example, there was a nurse. There was a post-it put on her computer. And it said something not nice. Hmm. And it devastated to her. Well, she couldn't come back to work for three days. So, oh, no. Her manager gave me a call and told me about the situation. I said, when did she come back to work? And she says, we'll be back Thursday. I said, okay. So Thursday, I just set up a meeting in the manager's office, the manager, her, and me. And I start out the conversation by asking about how long she's been here. And I said, are you married? She said, yes. We talked about her husband. Do you have children? She said, yes. And she's beaming. We talked all about her children. And I said, and I said what about their accomplishments? And she was just beaming. I mean, smiling. Told her about, she talked about her whole family. And I asked her, where did you work before here? And she told me and how she had a meteor, mediocre rise. And after she got done telling all that, I said, look at everything that you have. Look at everything that you've built. Look at what you have accomplished in a short amount of time where you started from. I said, not only that, the family that you've built. I said, how does that feel? 
She goes, it feels wonderful. I said, yes. I said, that's what you need to concentrate on. But I can't tell you this. The individual that left you that post-it, that's the person that needs help. That's the person that we need to help. Because that person is very upset. That person felt they deserve something. That the person that person's acting out. That's the person that we need to help. Look at what you've done. I said, how do you feel about that? And she started crying. She goes, you're absolutely right. She goes, I, I, I don't have to have that consume me. I said, you don't. You have all this greatness in you right now consuming you. And she got up, gave me a big hug, and then never again. I see her in the hallways every once in a while, and she just comes up and gives me a big hug. <laughs> but I do a lot of that. Uh, it helped me with the behavior health unit. It, uh, it's helped me. I deal a lot of, with risk and safety and just talking to staff. It's helped tremendously. It's helped for active shooter. I also do uh, active shooter drills. And I've had law enforcement involved, and law enforcement has asked me to participate with them going to other entities. So I just have a different lens. All of that with the workplace violence, active shooter, uh, it's helped me tremendously. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, new perspective is yeah. always beneficial. So, so it's not specifically under the domain of what we normally talk about on this podcast, but um, explain a little bit about the the active shooter. I have a program, a presentation that I do. And for the active shooter, it's I just, first I describe the scenarios and the settings. And there is a run, hide, fight video. And I talk about that. My lens is a little different on that. But uh, generally what happens is if their active shooter does come in, and I use the hospital scenario, mm -hmm. uh, if they do come in, you run if it's safe to do so. What I also add is that we have an emergency code in the hospital that if they're safe to get out of there, they will dial that code and there's an mm -hmm. announcement overhead. That's telling everyone not to go to that area. They just mm -hmm. announce where it is. Mm -hmm. But it's the active shooter. It's I've done so. I've, I've gone to every department and I've developed a uh, place where they can go and every single department knows where that's at. So when I run the drills, it's very eerie because I'll have law enforcement with me. The whole hospital participates, both campuses. Wow. And it's been, last year was the only year I haven't ran one, only because of the COVID. But yeah. uh, during the day when I'm running it and we walk through the hospital, it's very eerie. Because you also take uh, visitors, people from other departments, and you go into those rooms and... There's nobody in the hallways. There's nobody in the offices. There's nobody anywhere. So it's it's pretty impressive, and, and I run the drills. I also uh, can lock down the hospital quickly. But it's just talking about it and having them ask questions, and there is a security amongst them when they know that we practice it, what they would actually do in that situation. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you, you clearly provide a lot of information and value and service based on your experience to, you know, the hospitals where you work. But you've also shared with me that you are open to helping out other hospitals or other, organi you know, health organizations who Absolutely. It, yeah, maybe want to, um, I don't know, chat, chat with you, talk about what is working for you, maybe get suggestions you want to kind of throw throw out to everyone what you're yes. willing to do? Yes, it's uh it's it's not necessarily healthcare. There's uh universities have approached me, businesses have approached oh, me. Okay, nice. Gen grade schools and I mean it's everything from workplace violence to active shooter. Okay. to just basic security or even talking about mental illness mental illness and or signs of troubled children or people, you know, just target words that are being used that they can look for. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And then, um, so you're willing, so you have some defined workshops. You mentioned the, um, active shooters. So you have some other workshops available. I do. 
Okay, great. I do, and it's uh, it's 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 what I'm mainly doing. It's for the clinical therapy workplace violence, which covers just about everything, everything to how you can lessen it. A lot of times in workplace violence, they go straight for the de-escalation. Hmm. Well, by that time, it's on. There's a problem, and it's directly in your face, and it's already in motion. So a lot of workplace violence workshops I teach, I go way before that even happens, how you can lessen a situation. No. A lot of it is just engaging with individuals. It just is that they feel that they've been heard. Because when you ignore individuals and they can't be heard, that creates anxiety. And frustration. And frustration. And so it's, I have the workshop showing what you can do before this happens. We can't prevent violence. We can't prevent workplace violence. We can lessen it. We can't prevent it. So we put tools in place to lessen the opportunity for that situation to happen and or lessen injuries. But there's many aspects of workplace violence way before the situation is on. And then they talk about how you de-escalate the situation. A lot of it's more important way before that. But it's also very important to know how to de-escalate and how to report stuff. Very true. I would say critical. There's, there's situations in hospitals Quite a few that nurses feel it's part of being nursing to get hit. Nurses feel it's part of nursing that someone's threatening them, and they're like, okay, that's just part of nursing, it's just part of the thing. But what we don't have is a lot of times the nurse doesn't realize that if they don't report that and they don't tell their fellow workers, that other worker walks in their room with a person that hit them and then hit someone else. Or they don't... Oh. They don't share information about a violent patient or they don't share information about an individual about ideation and then that goes to the next department of his transferred and nobody has no idea what has just happened with this patient. So it's very important in workplace violence that you share information. Report everything. Even if there is workplace violence and you have an opportunity to press charges, that is up to you. You can always press charges and not charge, but it's always up to the individual press charges. And whatever entity they work in, that entity should welcome that and say, if you feel like pressing charges, be glad to do so and we'll support you. Hmm. What we don't want is like, no, you no, you didn't get hit hard enough or no, this shouldn't be affecting you. No, uh, don't press charges. We don't need that type of... Uh, uh, Minimizing the... Yeah, yes. The situation. Yeah, Correct. That doesn't, yeah, that doesn't help anything. Huh. Yes. Wow, really interesting. Yeah, I guess we, um, I mean, think about our nurses and our healthcare workers who are in those situations all the time where they actually then feel that this is part of their job. That yes. That just kind of tells you what they face on a daily and ongoing basis. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yep. We, uh, they're yes. true warriors, that's for sure. And they were yeah. tested the last year and a half. <laughs> yes. Yes, they sure were. Yep. We, um, yep, they are definitely true heroes. Um, well, now, now is typically the time in the podcast, Scott, where we would actually answer a listener question. But our conversation on the topic that we talked about today was so unique I'm actually going to throw that out the window today, and I'm going to ask you a question that I want to know. <laughs> okay. I love so, that. Yeah. So um, what is the most difficult situation that you encountered at one of the hospitals? Personally. I can... I can describe for me right now, it's situations and it's nobody's fault, but as leaders, what I've seen happen as leaders, our outside fear, we have to keep it outside of work. Our fears, we have to minimize as leaders because our staff, 
of a hundred or ninety or fifty when they have fear and they come to you it's our responsibility to let them know you know what I understand your fear this is what we have in place to take care of this we have this if this happens we come to here this is what we do about that please come to me if this anxiety rises again but a lot of times with TV media there's a lot of individuals that have their own outside fear and they bring it to work and they put their fear onto the staff It's not a huge blame on that individual, but it's something that needs to be addressed because it's happening more and more to where now you have an entire staff in fear and it's being authorized by the leader because the leader is agreeing with him saying, yes, you should be afraid. Yes, somebody can come in and hurt us at any time. It's very difficult as a leader to leave your fear outside of the door and not bring it into work with you. That's one of the biggest things that I'm seeing now and I've seen for a while. That will take a Herculean effort, but that can be done. Yeah, and you're helping to, to do that because if a leader can reassure everyone, you know, we, we have done the best that we absolutely possibly can do by creating this system and you know giving you the ability to do this or that or you know and having this plan you know so rest assured that we are prepared that that's what you're giving to leaders you're giving yes. that information to them so that so that they can come in and lead without fear and Correct. reassure everyone else that, that they don't need to be afraid. Or reach out. Reach out to somebody that you see that has been in this situation or reach out to somebody that has corrective measures or just insight and just reach out and say, you know what? I'm having a problem here with this. Hmm. Instead of being a leader and thinking, if I'm going elsewhere for help, it might show a sign of weakness or it might show a sign that I'm not doing my job very well, which we need to take that stigma away because we're all in this together. Yeah, we do. If, if, we, if we all communicated more, wouldn't it be a much better world? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it sure would. Yes. Um, okay, so I, I'm actually going to throw it to you and um, just let you talk about whatever you'd like to share here for, for our listeners. Any last thoughts or anything you really want to reiterate? Just being engaged, I mean, I think of young children, adolescents, and I know that's a mantra that everyone talks about and it's like understood, but it is very important uh, not to have as many directives, but give that child, adolescent, the opportunity to speak, just the freedom to speak. Even if it's something wrong, you can do coaching, some type of other measures to help them. What we don't want is to come at somebody hard saying you're doing something wrong because sooner or later you become a porcupine to them and they're not going to speak up and talk to you. So as much as it is painful the children can be <laughs> and difficult. We're both parents, yes. That's that that comes a part of the territory of parents. But there's a lot of good people out there. And Shelly, you're one of them. And I appreciate the forum. Uh and yes, uh that's probably the, I've, I've probably said most of the stuff that I've done, what I believe in. And since I was five years old, I had a few life experiences, but that's when I learned protect those who cannot and help those who cannot. And I've done that my whole life. Yes, you have. It was a very interesting life. We can't talk about that here, but 
<laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe one but day. But I love what I do. It. I love going to work every day. And every day is different. And every challenge is different. And just touching other people's lives, that's it's just amazing. Just amazing. Love that. Love that you're doing that. Love that you shared everything that you did today with our audience. And um, I'll act, we'll actually, of course, have all of Scott's contact information in the show notes. So if you want to reach out to him, you're, you you um, will have all of the information that you need to be able to do that. And I really appreciate you being on today and chatting with me, Scott. Thank you. All right. Thanks. If you are in crisis or know someone who is, please call or text the Suicide Lifeline. You can find out how to reach the Lifeline by looking for the numbers in the show notes of every single episode. If it wasn't glaringly evident in today's episode, I'm not a mental health or suicide prevention professional, and this is not an official AFSP podcast. I am determined, however, to find a way to help stop suicide in my community and to support those affected by suicide. Thanks for listening to Hope Out of the Darkness. To learn more about Shell, the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, and how to submit listener questions to be answered on the show, visit HopeOutOfTheDarkness.com.